So today we will see uh, one of the most important ideas in computer science, that is uh, recursion. So where you try to solve a problem by uh, uh, invoking, uh, by trying to solve a same problem, but on a smaller uh, size. And uh, so, like for example, let's say, you know, the factorial, uh, so, you know, factorial, right? So factorial n, you know, factorial n is one times two times, so on up to n. So mathematically speaking, you know, factorial n, you can write it as, uh, you know, n times uh, n minus one factorial. or you know, n minus one factorial into n. So this is very nice, right? So you are defining factorial in terms of factorial. And of course we need to have a base case every time we uh, uh, are working on recursive problems. So we need to have a base case, which is factorial zero is equal to one or factorial one is equal to one, any of those things, or even factorial two is equal to two. You can take any of these things as a base case. And this idea where, you know, in order to compute a function, you recursively invoke the same function. It uh, keeps uh, occurring again and again and again in uh, many places in computer science. So now let's see how we can write code for the factorial function. We will see more complex problems uh, for recursion, but this is the simplest example for recursion. And we will, uh, yeah, we will see how it goes. So we want to, what do we want? We want to write a new program. Fact.c, this is our new program. And uh, so include studio.h. So we want to write, uh, so we say enter printf, enter n percent d. So we are reading the input and then we want to call a function called fact. Fact stands for factorial or maybe let me use uh, factorial n is what we would like to compute. And I would say printf no, percent d factorial is equal to percent uh, You are doing good, yeah. You know, factorial is a, uh, it, it's the value of factorial n as the value of n increases, it keeps growing very rapidly. In fact, it uh, grows uh, exponentially. U stands for unsigned. So I will introduce a new data type. Uh, let me do one thing. So one thing I would like you to uh, see here is factorial n is equal to, okay, we'll, we'll fix it here. So one times, two times, three times, so on up to n, right? So can we say factorial n is greater than or equal to two power n? Yes or no? Can we say factorial n is greater than or equal to two power n, right? So good. So that means this is what is called as an exponentially growing function, two power n. So like, uh, so 
128, it grows very, very fast, this uh, exponentially growing function. Not for n is equal to 3, yeah? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's okay, guys. Understood. Good, good, good catch. But roughly you understood na, that it is uh, that the value of n grows exponential. That factorial n function, it grows exponential. Why are we printing pointer to n? Sorry. All right. Are you all with me here? That factorial n is a exponentially growing function. Maybe in the in next class I will show you the graphs for factorial n and uh, no two power n and uh, a linear function of n and see what. Uh, so since you are all on Google, no check what what percent LU stands for. Can, can you all look and tell me what percent LU stands for? Yeah. Long, unsigned, unsigned, long. Good. So when we say that uh, when we are working with uh, numbers, which are uh, which take only positive values, which take only non-negative values, that is greater than or equal to zero, we can declare that variable to be unsigned. Like for example, even on line 10, since we are defining no factorial for only positive numbers, we can even make the n on line number 10 as unsigned. Okay, only positive numbers. Long means the size of the amount of memory allocated to an integer is four bytes. But if it is a long integer, probably eight bytes would be allocated. How do we know how, how do we know that the size of a variable, uh, how much memory is allocated to a particular data type using size of, right? So let's see, for the time being, you know, I will just comment this code out, okay? So, and then I will comment this code. to see on my machine how much uh, usually for unsigned int and signed int the memory allocated will be the same. The number of bytes of memory allocated for unsigned and signed int will be the same. Unsigned long. I missed a, I missed a comment, huh? Ah, okay. Got it. Thank you. GCC, what is this uh, program? What's the name of this program? Fact.c.
Okay, let's see what, what it means. So you can see that the memory for, uh, yeah, so we can keep void here. So there are few uh, warnings, but if you ignore them, you can see four bytes of uh, memory is allocated uh, to an integer and uh, eight bytes is allocated to unsigned long. So are you all with me here so far? So just want to mention here quickly, if you, I am not, I, I'm not sure if you learned about representation of members. So if you work on a positive numbers alone, which is a much easier to thing to understand. Let's say if you have a, uh, if you have an unsigned, uh, if you have an unsigned number with four bytes, four bytes is 32 bits. Four bytes is 32 bits. So B naught to B31. So the value of this number, the value of this number, the decimal value of this number is sigma i is equal to 0 to uh, 31, uh, 2 power i bi. Are you, do you know this? So did you, you have come across this before, right? Yes or no? This is not hashing, this is just a, Yeah, maybe in Monday class, what I will do is I will, I will cover these ideas, okay? So I let me hold this off, let me hold this discussion. And uh, this is binary notation. In the Monday class, I will, uh, I will take up this topic. It's an important topic, for, we will keep this aside. But for the time being, all I would like you to understand is uh, that uh, that unsigned int and unsigned long int, if you, since eight bytes are allocated to an unsigned long integer variable, what happens is uh, it can store a greater range of numbers. The maximum value that you can store within an unsigned long int will, will be bigger. All right. Okay, so let's keep that aside. All I want you to understand is that the memory that is allocated for unsigned long int is greater than the memory that is allocated for unsigned int. And that is a useful thing while computing factorial because the value just keeps growing very, very fast. So because of that, uh, it's, it's good to use uh, an unsigned long int data type for the value written by the factorial function. So what is the base condition here? You got n, you will check if uh, n is equal to zero. If n is equal to zero, what is the factorial? What should be written? What is the value of the factorial function? You just return one. And if n is not equal to one, otherwise what do you do? You say, yeah, you temporary, R10 is equal to n times factorial. Yeah, yeah. So, Vijit, you have a point, but uh, yeah, just. Are you all good with the code? I will just remove this uh, comment or this code. Does it make sense? All of all of you are with me here. No, 
if n is equal to 0 on it goes to line number 7 and on line number 7 we return from the function no i don't understand shrikar what do you mean Shrikar Desu, I didn't get your question. On line number six. Oh, okay, okay. Or n is equal to. Okay, got it. No, not necessary actually. It's not necessary. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Good, good. So now let's compile this program. Now today I want to, in the last class, uh, let's run this program, okay, and see if it is working. No, factorial four, it's two, Good, right? It is all looking all right. No problem. Good. So I want to see how this, uh, I want you to understand how this whole thing works by tracing. So let's try to run, uh, start. So in the last class, we were using GDB and TUI to you know, TUI within GDB to trace the program, but I'm a bit unhappy with the TUI interface uh, because it is having a little bit of weird behavior here and there, which makes the whole experience of GDB bad, especially if you are looking at GDB for the first time. So we will do GDB, we will uh, do GDB on the, from Visual Studio Code itself, VS Code Editor itself. So now what we do is, uh, you know, uh, I am putting a breakpoint, I will put a breakpoint on, uh, I, will, on, I will put a, Yeah, what is there on line number three? So what, what are we passing to the factorial function? We are passing a value to a factorial function, an argument to a factorial function, and its data type is integer. And the factorial returns a value, and the value returned by the factorial function, it is of type unsigned long int. It is of type unsigned long int. That's all it is saying, nothing more than that. So unsigned says that it you know that the data type is always positive, number one. Long means instead of allocating four bytes of memory to hold the value, eight bytes of value will be, uh, eight bytes of value will be held. What do you mean by factorial getting computed automatically, Maya? We have written code, now. It will work. If you don't try it unsigned, it will work. It's not an issue. It will still work. No, we are passing a parameter. We studied functions in the last class, right? Yes or no? We studied functions. We studied, we kind of refactored the prime number, uh, the code for prime numbers. And we know what how a function looks like. It takes some parameters and it returns some value. So in the case of factorial function, we are passing a parameter to factorial, which is of type integer, and the factorial returns a value, which is of type unsigned long integer. So factorial is calling factorial again. No, we are defining factorial on line number three, right?
no the local again we are the story we are going back to the same story the local variable n in line number 16 that is in main its scope is within the function main and it is different from the local variable n in the function factorial okay now let's uh, okay so let's trace this program and see what is happening this guy you are all uh, pretty confused that's what i see from here so i am putting a break point on line 11 line 25 in order to put a break point i am going to run and using this toggle break point uh, function toggle break all right so now i am starting uh, please pay attention i am doing this start debugging okay just give me a minute i'll fix this one So now run start the game. So let's say I enter five. Huh? Why there is no break point? Okay. So now let's say start the game. why is this break point not enabled disable all remove all break points Just one minute, guys. There is a issue. Run, start debugging, right? Hmm. No, no, that's not the thing that. Uh, Yeah, there is a break point I have set here, but for some reason it's not. Uh... Yesterday I did uh, nicely with no problem. What will it do? No, no, no. All those things are not the problems, guys. All those things are not. Let me do one thing. I'll exit, and I don't know the reason. It is behaving weird. So let's see. Ah, okay. I don't know the problem, so now it started working. 
So, ah, okay, maybe I see the issue. Let us do. No, no, I want to do it on uh, here itself. GCC minus G. I think I know the problem. Yeah, this is now it will work. So, yeah, let's start again now. So, terminal. Yeah, so I'm removing all breakpoints. I'm removing all the breakpoints and I'm keeping a breakpoint on line number 25. Toggle breakpoint and I'm saying uh, restart debugging. Great. Minus G is you have to compile the program using minus G to do GDB now. So you are supposed to Try out GDB. You didn't try it, uh, Siddiq. How to GDB a program? Without compiling, if you don't compile the program using minus G, you cannot do the debugging. You should try it now. That's one of the things I told you. So now, anyway, so we entered five. So now you can see that uh, the breakpoint is on uh, line number 25. So now we are on line number 25. So what I do is there are two options, step into and step out or step over. I am calling step into here. When I click step into, we enter the factorial end function, step into. So one thing now, this is what I want you to pay attention to. If you see, are you seeing the call stack here on the left side, the call stack? So what is the call stack? Main called factorial. Main called factorial. That is how the call stack is looking like. So if you see, uh, if, if, I, if I press main, we called factorial in the function main on line number 25. And when we call the factorial function on line number 25, the value of n, which is a local variable of main, it is equal to five. This is the first thing that I would like you to understand. Or let me actually restart the debugging process. Okay, because I want to make this clear. I'm entering the value of if you of uh, uh, n is equal to five. So if you see, uh, are you all with me here that uh, right now we are on line number 25, it is not executed. The call stack contains only the activation record for main. And in the activation record for the main, the local variable n is allocated memory and the, its current value is equal to 5. Are you all with me here? First point, I want everyone to be with me on this. So we have a program stack. And on the program stack, for every active function, there is what is called as an activation record program stack or call stack. On the call stack, only the current active function is main. And uh, the value, uh, so the main has a local variable n, and its value is equal to 5. Some of you were asking questions about uh, you know, this, all these things before, so I want you to be with me on this. The next thing I am doing is I am stepping into, so the factorial next function, uh, we would like to trace how factorial function executes. So we use uh, the, we, we use the step into functionality. So when we do step into functionality, uh, so notice how the call stack changed. So on the top of the main, the activation record for factorial got pushed. And if you look at the activation function for the factorial fun activation record, for the factorial function, it has two parameters. One is n and other is, uh, so it has a parameter n and it's a local variable fact n. But for all practical purposes, for the a parameter is nothing but a local variable, except that its initial value is automatically uh, uh, assigned, is, it is initialized to a value based on what is the parameter that is being passed. So the parameter that is being passed is five in function mean. So in function mean, we pass it five as the parameter here. We pass it five as the parameter here. 
this file gets copied into the memory that is associated with uh, uh, with n in the in the factorial function and fact n is also a local variable and you can see this and this particular way of parameter passing mechanism is what is called as a call by value i want you to make a note it's an important technical term to remember that is the value in the main when we are calling function in, in main when we are calling the factorial we are passing five as a parameter and this five is getting copied into the memory that is allocated to the local variable n uh, in this case that's the argument n uh, which is a, which acts as a local variable for the factorial function are you all with me here so far does it make sense are you doing good this example is very critical is this i want you to understand the call stack i want you to understand how memory for local variables is, is allocated call by value is uh, the there are multiple there is there are two important parameter passing mechanisms i will just tell you about call by value in today's class there is another method called as uh, approach called as call by reference call by reference but this is not available in c this call by reference it is not available in c no pointers are not call by reference pointers are also call by value okay so there is a call by value parameter passing mechanism and what do we do in call by value parameter passing mechanism when the function main calls factorial with the parameter 5 this 5 gets copied into the into the argument variable n can if it's also parameter passing it's call by value only in c only call by value is available can you all focus here we will uh, you are all thinking right only but we will uh, so the val so if you see the point that is what is important here is so i will draw the stack here for you i will draw the stack here again for you so if you see this this is main in main there is n so this is equal to 5 and then this is the this is for uh, you know factorial this is for factorial so there is one n here there is a fact n here and the whatever the, so when we when main calls fact n with 5 as the parameter so somewhere main calls fact with 5 as parameter this 5 gets copied to the memory that is associated with the variable n in fact and there is absolutely no relationship between this memory location and this memory location they are not related at all so this and this they are not related at all does this make sense so any changes that you make to this variable n that's not the right way to think not two fives there are two this n and this n is different you can have anything here it's not going to change like for example the the n in the fact no it is holding five it can be anything it's no functions doesn't have memory address inside the stack no yeah so now let's that's true we can there is no necessity for it being n it can be anything that so anyway see okay guys let's hold on to your questions for a while and then i'll answer your questions again uh so right now what i want you to understand is main calls factorial with 5 as parameter okay 
and uh, so you are in now we are in factorial and the value of n is equal to 5 and let's step for this so n is not equal to 5 we go here we are on line number 9 so now we step into so now i want you to pay attention here so now factorial 5 factorial 5 called factorial 4 so there are two different uh, activation records for two different activations of uh, factorial. Are you with me here? So mean, it just turned out to be equal to zero, but it can be any garbage value. Don't pay attention to it. So fact called fact four, and fact 4 called fact 3. No, sorry, not fact 3. All right. So, so now the value of n is equal to 4. So this condition turns out to be false. So you go to line number 9. And then we step into uh, this. So now you can see on the call stack, so factorial 4 called factorial 3, factorial 4 called factorial 3, uh, this is what is called as a recursion. You call the same factorial 3. And factorial, so yeah, no, no the factorial 3 calls factorial 2. You can see the call stack that the value of uh, n is equal to 2. So factorial 3 calls factorial great so now again you go you can see now factorial 2 called uh, factorial 1 So now factorial one called factorial zero. So now in factorial zero, the value of n is equal to zero. So what happens is the value of n is equal to zero. The, the activation record for the current function factorial zero is on the top of the stack. So this is the activation record. And the bottom of, sorry, this is the call stack. The bottom of the call stack has mean, and uh, it calls factorial five. Factorial five calls factorial four. I want you to pay attention here. And factorial four calls factorial three. Factorial three calls factorial two. Factorial two calls factorial one. Factorial one calls factorial uh, zero. And now we are in the factorial zero and the value of n is equal to zero. So this condition turns out to be true. So let's see what happens. So since n is equal to zero, zero we came here and it returns one. So now let's see. So factorial one returns. Uh, so factorial one, uh, let me use a different color. So factorial one, it returns, uh, what does it return? It returns uh, uh, one back to factorial one. And once factorial one returns, the activation record associated with fact zero, it gets popped out from the call stack. It gets popped out from the call stack. So now once the activation record associated with fact zero is popped out from the call stack, the one that is there on the top of the stack is fact one. And what is, so what does fact one return? Fact one returns to one times one, okay? Because n is equal to one here and factorial zero returned one, so one times one. So if you see the value of fact 10, it is equal to one. So the value returned by, uh, the value returned by fact one to fact 10 is one. Are you all with me here? Are you able to follow what I'm showing here. So now if you trace again, so once we, uh, once we are out of fact one, so once we are out of fact one, so now we are into fact two. 
now we are into fact two uh, because this got popped off and one got returned and if you see uh, what fact two returns fact two takes this one and multiplies it by two and it returns uh, two up here so again now what happens so now you go back so now what is there on the top of the stack is fact three and uh, no fact three returns three times uh, no whatever the value written by fact two which is nothing but six it returns six so let's keep going so now fact four is on the top of the stack four times whatever fact three has written so it returns 24 So what is there on the top of the stack? You can see what is there on the top of the stack is factorial 5 and main is there, main is below it. So it returns, uh, now 5 times 24 is uh, 120. So now 120 gets printed and uh, by main and that's the end of the story. Are you all with me here in this example? That's true. Every time his function is called, a memory for that activation of the function will be allocated on the stack. And that is what, what is called as uh, activation record. Of course, no, that's multiple lengths. That's the whole point of this example, that multiple lengths, every function, active function, it has its own memory. Every active function, it has its own version of n. And there is no relationship between these. We can return, of course, n times factorial n minus 1. Maybe you would save some space. That's, that's true, Nachiketya. I The reason why I wanted to do, it, do this example in this particular way is for you to make you understand that every that uh, the, the n and fact n uh, every activation of the function it has its own version of n and fact n. No, no. The every you can call uh, any function can call any function. It no. There is no necessity for arguments. What do you mean by this type use a lot of memory, J? No, recursion or not, no, let's, uh, it takes space, but it's okay, not an issue. It depends on the problem. Uh, the memory required depends on the depth of the recursion and uh, yeah, so it is all right. Good point, though. So, so J has this nice uh, observation that in this particular case, the memory occupied is equal to the depth of the stack or the depth of the recursion. So, if you are computing uh, factorial n, if you are computing factorial n, uh, uh, then uh, the 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 space required. So, space uh, required. Space required is proportional to n, where n is uh, if you are computing factorial n, if you use this uh, recursive approach. Are you all with me here on this example? Call by reference, not today, maybe in the next class I will take, take it up. It is possible to call main from main. Yeah, maybe you can use VS Code debugger. I, it's all right. It's up to you. We can use GDB also. It's not an issue. Especially for the particular thing that I'm trying to show, I'm not happy. That's the reason I am using this uh, VS Code thing. Otherwise, uh, GDB is also good. 
So the question now is, is loop more efficient than uh, this? So let's do this. Fat loop plus. So what do we do for uh, i is equal to initially, we initialize fact 10 is equal to 1. Let me clear all my screen. So how do we do i less than or equal to n plus plus i fact n is equal to fact n times does this work loop yeah we can keep the it's okay it's not uh, that's not the point of this exercise but uh, the written fact factorial 5 you can use i plus plus but it would cause problem or let's not you should not uh, make the code cryptic we should make the code as clean as possible so i would think this is a much cleaner code than using fact n is equal to so you know all these things are possible for example you can uh, maybe have fact n is equal to fact n times uh, i plus plus is one possibility or uh, fact n star equal to i plus plus so while well, these are all possibilities these are uh, prone to errors because you need to remember the precedence and all those things correctly and what happens and you don't get anything out of it except uh, making your code look more complex. So it's not, uh, let's, uh, so to the extent possible, and un unless you have a good reason to do it, don't do that. Write the code in this uh, clean fashion. Yeah, so whatever, no, so all those things. Uh, so in fact, I would even say maybe the best thing to do is, uh, the best code to write is, i is equal to i plus 1. This is the best way to write the code. No confusion at all. So now, uh, the important thing is, if you look at the factorial computation, if you look at the factorial computation, we have two versions of fa factorial computation. So one is uh, recursive version, which we have seen first, and the other is uh, iterative version. Recursive and iterative version. So if you look at the time required, the in in the case of the number of multiplications that are comp that are required, if you see time, so in terms of time, in recursion also approximately we are using n multiplications, not approximately we are using n multiplications or n operations. In iterative version also we are using n operations. But if you look at the space, can you tell me something about the space? How much uh, space is required approximately in iterative? Yeah, maybe, you know, like uh, eight bytes for fact 10 and maybe, you know, maybe four bytes for i. So let's say 12 bytes. How much memory is required in the case of the recursive function? Yeah, something like approximately 12 n. There's a depth of the stack. Proportional to n is the right way to, is an easier way to say. So because, you uh, know, fact 10 calls fact 10 minus one, and fact n minus one calls fact n minus two, so, so on and so forth. So if you see here, if, if you follow this whole uh, recursion stack, you can see that the space required is proportional to n. That's the right way to put it. 
So in this particular case, factorial doesn't have any advantage uh, per se. There is no advantage for factorial. But uh, iterative version has an advantage. It will be fast, it takes less memory. So iterative version is good. But there are some problems where you know, uh, a recursive approach is much easier to handle than an iterative approach in spite of any performance problems that you may have with it. Okay. 12 is in the memory required for fact 10 plus the memory required for i, which is 4 bytes, 8 plus 4. And of course, n is also there, but uh, maybe you can even say 16 bytes. So before we conclude, so I want to give a challenge problem. Now that we know, we have seen how recursion works, I want to give a cha challenge problem for you. Can we make a function where the number of like printf, it is possible where, uh, but it requires a bit more effort, but we will study later if at all. It's not difficult. It's just that you have to look at the details. There's a way to do each range, variable number of inputs. So now before we conclude today's lecture, I want to throw a challenge problem for you to work. And if anyone solve the challenge problem, you can, uh, We can compute Sterling ring number with recursion. Huh? Good. Yeah, it looks like that. It's a good example too. Yeah, maybe Siddiq, I will see. It's, it's a good problem, then I will give actually. All right. So, so in the so there is in the in the last week in the office hours. Uh, so one of you pointed out uh, the fact there is this problem, right? So uh, you have one of the problems is you have a twenty dollar bill, you have a ten, you have ten dollar bills, you have five dollar bills, and you have one dollar bills, and given some x amount of money. So we would like to express this x amount of money. Uh, using uh, this $20, $10, $5, and $1 bills, and you want to minimize the number of bills that's used. So like, for example, if it is $30, you use no, $20 plus uh, no, $10. This is the approach that uh, that is given. Like use as many $20 bills as possible, and then uh, no, use uh, later on use $10 bill, so on and so forth. So let's say, but someone, one of you observed that if you have a $26 bill and uh, no, $10, $5, and $1, and if you approach, apply the same approach, then you will use one $26 bill and four $1 bills. So the overall number of notes used is five notes. Five notes or five coins you use. One $26 coin and four $1 coin. But on the contrary, so you can express it uh, using three into $10. So you'll use only $3, uh, three coins. So this approach that is given in the textbook, it works only for this case, but there are other cases where it doesn't uh, work. Now the challenge problem for you, the challenge problem for you is if you have denominations, if you are given general denomination d1, d2, so on up to dk, uh, in this particular case, in here, this is d1, this is d2, this is d3, this is d4. And in this case, this is uh, d1, this is d2, this is d3, this is d4. It need not be only four, it can be you know any arbitrary number, but fixed number of denominations. And given a amount n, given n, given n. So what you have to do is you have to find a denomination sigma i is equal to 1 to k xi into di. So n is equal to sigma xi into dk such that you know, sigma 
xi i is equal to 1 to k is uh, minimal is minimal so this is the problem you they are not sorted you can assume they are sorted it's not going to change anything here. you can assume they are sorted so th this is the challenge problem for you if anyone solves this challenge problem let me know challenge problem i want you to make a note of this problem is k is fixed k is it is there now so there are k you take as input k denominations okay like uh, what are the different kinds of bills that are available d1 d2 dk like in one particular instance the user may enter 26 10 5 1 dollar and then after you get the denomination you take the amount you request the user no i want you to write the code for this write test no, I am not challenged for all the challenge problems. We don't give test cases. You think about it and do it. Okay. And given an amount, you should express, you should find, uh, uh, you should check if we can express an, uh, you have to find uh, the denominations for expressing n such that this is uh, minimal. Sigma i is equal to 1 to k, x i is minimal. No, how is it different? Because this, uh, the original problem is doesn't solve it for you. Because you can see, if you apply the original pro the approach, you are using five coins, but there is a different approach which gives you three coins. So the variable number of inputs is not the question. That's a simpler thing to handle. That's a simpler thing to handle. The challenge is how do we come up with an algorithm which takes uh, care of no which is optimal independent of what denominations that are given. What do you mean by? You are missing the point guys. How many of you understood the problem I'm trying to highlight? The problem is the approach that is given in the textbook works only for certain denominations. Like this is an example denomination where it works. But there are other denominations where the approach doesn't work. So you have to come up with a different algorithmic approach to solve it. So anyway, so this is the challenge problem that I want you to think about and uh, write code for it. And if you solve it, so let me know what's your approach. We will uh, see in the next class. What is the doubt problem you have? You tell me it's... Uh, Yeah, you take the denominations as input. No, no, I don't want to hear your approaches now. So just one minute. So Pradam, you think about it in the, just give me a minute, I'll like answer your question, Pradam. Hold on guys, one more minute before you sign off. I want to see. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so let me do one thing. Yeah. So what's the story? So let's. Uh, yeah. So Pradham. So so we, there is only one variable fact and right. So every time you uh, you do an assignment, you think a new version of the variable gets created in this function. In function factorial, the local variable fact and it is just allocated eight bytes of memory. And we know the address of that uh, variable if by you can take address of fact and, and print it. So why will it take uh, no uh, memory proportional to n? Of course, no, that's the whole point, right? You are missing. We have come this far. So in the course, the memory for it is uh, it not going to the whatever the value. It's like a placeholder. Whenever you can read from it and you can write into it. The old value is overwritten with the new value. Okay. Okay then. That's all I have for you guys today. We'll uh, catch up on uh, Monday. See you. I think you should all. Uh, the point of this problem is if you can solve the problem for four denominations, solving the problem for k denominations, it is. It's not at all difficult. No, 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 not Monday, Tuesday.